Hello, welcome to Graphic Policy Radio, the podcast where comics and politics meet. This is the show for people who realize that Stan Lee wasn't just the gentleman who makes humorous cameos in Marvel films. We are a comics podcast and we are here to talk about one of the most influential people in the history of comics and actually in greatest shapers of popular culture in the world and how we think and talk about heroism. Um, this is your host, Elon Eleven, a.k.a. Elon of Brooklyn, and joining me today uh, on the show uh, is a special guest I'm excited to have. Uh, Spencer Ackerman is a national, a senior national security correspondent at the Daily Beast. You may know him from helping to break the Edward Snowden story. Um, he wrote a major eulogy of Stan and his legacy for the Daily Beast, which I found to be the most uh, the piece that I was most happy to have seen out there, frankly, in the response to uh, Stanley's death this past week. I uh, really feel like it's essential reading, although we will not be talking in this particular conversation with the assumption that you have read it, but you guys should go out and read it. Um, and uh, he'll be talking with me as, you know, we're both people who've talked a lot about um, comics history uh, and um, we are eager to re resume some of that conversation in light of this recent death. I'll, I'll just kick this off to say that Stanley was born Stanley Martin Lieber, December 28th, 1922 in Manhattan in New York City in the apartment of his Romanian-born Jewish immigrant parents who uh, were over in the upper uppermost, westernmost side of Manhattan. And his father was trained as a dress cutter and he only worked sporadically after the Great Depression. Um, so his family was practically my family as is the case for a lot of the uh, creators of the comic industry back then. Um, and that is the context through which we find Stan Lee. So, uh, you know, one of the things I, 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 I it's, 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 it's challenging sort of when Stan Lee died because, you know, we, we, if anybody who knew anything about comics knew that the end was going to be sooner than later. So we all kind of had this opportunity to think about like, how do we want to address his death when it happens? It's not something that was like a shock to, to people. Um, so, you know, Spencer, when you when you began working, you you must have been working on your recent piece before, you know, the death happened, right? I assume, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in particular, uh, I was asked to look into writing an obit for Stan in January when he had uh, a, a bout of, of poor health, or it was reported yeah. that his health had taken a turn for the worse. And at first I was kind of afraid to do it. Uh, if I'm, if I'm honest with you, um, just because like over the course of time that I've talked to people in and around comics, it's kind of considered like a dirty open secret that, you know, a substantial portion of the fandom and of both contemporaries and especially, uh, you know, descendant comic creators um, that like Stan Lee um, ultimately ripped off Jack Kirby uh, creatively, uh, took credit that he didn't deserve um, away from the greatest genius that comics has ever had, um, which also meant that it was a company taking away wealth from its creator um, mm -hmm. because Stan Lee wasn't just an editorial figure at Marvel. He was related to the, the publisher by marriage. Um, yeah. He had a contract with the company and everyone else were, were freelancers. So this is also, you know, an epic labor dispute uh, as well mm -hmm. as it is a creative debate uh, and a historical assessment. And I sort of, you know, didn't know if, you know, the kind of moment would be right, right when Stan dies, uh, to actually have this conversation. Um, I, you know, everyone in theory would agree that, like, you do have to have an honest obituary or as honest an obituary as you can write. But in practice, you know, it's a real human being who's died and it's someone you care about. Mm -hmm. And those things are, are very raw. And ultimately, I came down on, on the side of, well, you know, understanding that this is going to be a very emotional day for a community that I consider myself, however tangentially, part of. Um, how would someone who, you know, really believes um, in... Uh, the genius of Jack Kirby, uh, 
and the relative obscurity uh, of Jack Kirby relative, of course, to Stan, um, mm -hmm. what would a kind of forthright but honest obituary that was backed up by, by some degree of reporting, you know, present? And that, what would that look like? And that was what I, you know, endeavored to do. Thank you for your kind words about it. Um, I, I don't know if I got everything right, honestly, I tried. Um, but, you know, what, what I found, let me ask you this, I want to, mm -hmm. I think um, you and I both kind of come from what, for lack of a better term, may be called the, the Jacobin wing of the Jack Kirby fandom. <laughs> yes. Where, where, do, yes, where do you yes. come in with Stan? Oh, God. Well, you know, it was definitely, to quote the words of uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, emotions high, emotions low, emotions in between. I um, <laughs> You know, we're in this moment where uh, we actually are having a lot of people in comics talking about comics history in a public conversation and have the opportunity to help educate the general public for most of whom do not know who Jack Kirby was and most of whom have a sense of who Stan Lee is that is not accurate but is like at least they have an idea maybe a little bit um and but yeah we're seeing we were just seeing this like dialogue that felt like it was leaving out significant parts of his identity like even if even if Stan Lee had never been to a synagogue in his entire life mm. The fact that he is Jewish is incredibly important to the history of comics. Uh, it's why he was stuck working in the comics industry and not like writing the great American novel and like having a professorship at Princeton or whatever. And I say stuck in the sense that early in his career, before he became Stan the Man of Comics, uh, he had said that he'd always wanted to write the great American novel and he'd inspired to write, you know, what would have been considered at the time serious literature. Uh, but the you know the only access he had to the publishing industry was comics because Jewish people were allowed to work in the comics industry. Um, you know one of the reasons he had a pseudonym, in addition to the fact that he wanted to sound less Jewish and more marketable, was that he wanted to like save his actual legal name for when he'd finally get to write that serious novel. So he needed a pen name um, to use in the short term. Uh, so we do know that working on comics was not Stan's first choice as a young writer, right? Indeed. And um, that piece of it was missing. And then the whole labor aspect of like, of it was missing. And I feel like too often people think that you have to either be like, it is possible for Stan Lee to both be a, a visionary person and a person who screwed his employees. Like, you know, I, even if he wrote no words to paper other than with great power also comes great responsibility into a fable that has lived on for generations of children's lives, that in and of itself would be worthy of commemoration. But the fact that he sort of helped build this interwoven universe with the different titles and like inventing Marvel as a con as, as a as a brand really mm -hmm. is incredibly important, even though frequently his contributions to the actual stories he participated in were not what he said they were. And even though he was like literally doing dirty his workers. So you can be a genius and a bad person in some aspects of your life. Like these things are not at odds and you can be a great person in other aspects of your life. Like where it's just not, and it feels like everything has been too much structured into the format of like heroes and villains in a way that has made it been impossible to have a real conversation. So we could try that. That's my short take. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I really think that like, it's just, you know, you can think about what if only like Marvel had collectivized, <laughs> like what we would have had. Um, because I do think that like them work that that, that Stan and, and Jack together were and and Stan and, and, and Steve together, like there, that there was something to them working together. I mean, personally, my favorite Kirby work is the stuff he did solo later on. But I don't know that he necessarily would have gotten there without also having been working with someone like stand in in the intermediary time right and you know that's the creative partnership that is the, really the foundation for for basically every comic that you guys read now um so i think that stanley is a complicated person and undoubtedly a genius even if he's not the inventor of everything that he says he's an inventor of necessarily um and i think certain amounts of the legacy kind of escaped from him like you can see mm -hmm. In that conversation, I think this was in your piece where you talked about the call in to WBAI. Oh, yeah. It's an extraordinary Let's... moment. 
Let's talk about that. So maybe we'll, we'll kind of go into this in medias res and then sort of work our way backward. Um, okay. Because a lot goes into what makes this, this phone call so special. Um, so this is around, um, I want to say, either the very late 80s or, or 1990. I think you said 1990. In that I think it was case. 1990. Yeah, something that that sounds right. Um, and WBAI in New York uh, is a is a Pacifica uh, affiliate uh, public radio station, um, and so it has a whole lot of like unique programming um, that very much like uh, shape the culture of New York in in many different ways, and. Mm-hmm. One of the shows that, you know, particular evening in winter, I guess, 1990, uh, Jack Kirby is on, like, giving a kind of life assessment. And it, by this point, is much of the standard issue um, Kirby line, which is, you know, particularly as he gets older and especially after a particularly bitter period uh, and litigious period with Marvel in the 1980s about reclaiming uh, his old artwork. Um, you know, Stan, I'm sorry, Jack gets, uh, you know, more kind of creative with the facts, but it's generally just like a very distilled version of, of what he's been, you know, really agitated about for 20 plus years, uh, which is Stan Lee stole his credit and accordingly stole his wealth. That mm-hmm. Kirby during you know the what what's comics you know possibly greatest ever renaissance period uh the dawn in 1961 of the marvel age with with everything that uh kirby and and lee invent together stan takes sole credit for and does so in such a way that while superficially praising jack as the king of comics he represents that he's in fact the driving force on everything. And so mm-hmm. what Stan would then immediately plead and say, but I, you know, he, he's the king, you know, he was the greatest who ever did it. Uh, I was so privileged to be working with him. Those were great years. We made great things together. Comes across as this after the fact justification that nevertheless centers Stan as the one who, who drives everything. And it's Jack and his partisans contention that, in fact, that order of operation is completely reversed. And, you know, in many cases, you know, Stan acted more like we would understand an editor to act, which, you know, makes yep. sense because he was the editor of Marvel Comics. Um, and so Jack is giving, you know, this, you know, particularly, you know, salty version of this critique on WBAI and out of nowhere. Uh, Stan calls in and is just like, I was listening, you know, randomly while I'm in New York after a convention. Um, And I heard you call, you know, I heard you talking, Jack, and I just, you know, wanted to let you know that, you know, I had the greatest time working with you. It was the greatest period that we did this. And like Jack immediately kind of melts and, you know, is just like, you know, Stanley, I never regretted any of it. You know, those were, those, those really were great years, you know, and then, you know, quickly through the conversation, like it, it's almost like Jack starts overcompensating and saying, mm-hmm. you know, I never sweated, you know, who got credit for, you know, for who and what. And like, well, yes, no, you spent you 20 you odd, to. You, you spent yeah. 20 plus years, you mm-hmm. know, and, pretty yeah. much obsessing and, over it. And, and not a financial necessity, right? Like, this isn't, like, about an ego. This is about, like, you need to have this money for your family. So, and you weren't given equity for the labor. That's it. Yeah. And know? so a couple things about this. It's, you know, for the standards of his time, Jack Kirby was an incredibly well compensated artist. And you often hear this, you know, get brought up by sort of, like, the secondary level um, of, of like the, the Stan Jack, you know, revisionism, uh, corrective dialectic, um, <laughs> that, you know, if, you know, Ramita didn't get what, what Kirby got, Ditko didn't get what Kirby got, you know, by the time he goes to DC comics, I've heard a figure that, 
you know, adjusted, DC is paying him like in 2018 money, something like 400, maybe, yeah, maybe something like $400,000 uh, mm-hmm. annually. And then pause for a second. Marvel sold yep. to Disney for $4.1 billion. Yep. The, the valuation since then, and even, you know, early, as early as the 1960s, you know, they started marketing and licensing those characters real quick. And it was like, you know, nothing really since like Superman and Batman. And it's not a matter, and I, I find it like a particularly, you know, short-sighted, if not like deliberately ugly, you know, argument that like tacitly comes attached with it is that, you know, Kirby, you know, should shut up because he, you know, he had it real good. But, you know, he didn't have it real good compared to Stan Lee, who, yeah. you know, not only, like, had a degree of equity in this company, but, you know, portrayed himself as being its driving force um, when you have, you know, you know, pretty good arguments that, you know, both before and after, you know, their, their workings with, with Stan, you know, most of these artists... You know, particularly those who who kind of go on to have you know, you know, careers after uh, the nineteen sixties, they typically invent. You know, they they come up with with other characters. They you know they do other mm-hmm. stories, um, and Stan kind of doesn't, and he has the um, the sort of convenient alibi that by seventy two he becomes president and publisher of Marvel, um, and he's not um, really you know doing anything uh, creatively. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it's, it's hard not to, not to wait that. And now having yeah. said that, I, I want to make the argument for why if, and this is my preliminary hypothesis, I, I believe, you know, there's a whole lot more research to be done than I've done. Um, but, you know, preliminarily my hypothesis is, is that, you know, Kirby creatively, you know, deserves 75% of creating Marvel and Stan deserves 25%. And now, having given that ridiculous arbitrary figure that I hope nevertheless kind of like gives you a sense of where I come down on this, yeah. recognizing that it's a ridiculous arbitrary figure, I want to make the case for why that 25% is so crucial to, to every bit of pop culture, you know, that comes after it. Certainly every bit of comic books that comes after it, right? Like I'm right for, there with you. That, that, sounds, that sounds right to me. That sounds right to me. So first of all, all of us kind of know in, in the comics world what, you know, kind of creatively goes along with, with an editor-in-chief's era, right? I mean, in some cases, reducing the number of monkeys in the uh, series. <laughs> well, I mean, like... Sorry. I had, to, I had to make a Julie Schwartz joke, but you may continue. You may continue. So... I, that was just over my head. <laughs> sorry, no, there, there, I'm sorry. There was, there, there was like apparently like comics with with great apes in them were selling incredibly well, but then after they realized that people were putting great apes in DC, yeah. uh, people were putting too many apes, and Julie Schwartz was like, "I'm guy, guys, I, you're right to try to like market this this way, but you we can't have more than one ape on the cover of a got comic it. per month, per week, so you got sorry anyway. Well, I, but but like you kind of know under an editorial regime what you know what it's interesting and what it's not right like yeah. there's a jim shooter era of marvel and you can kind of understand what that looks like right like intuitively yeah and you know the jeff johns era at dc kind of like the same sort of thing mm-hmm. well wouldn't you agree that like the greatest editor who brings in the greatest status quo of all time ought to go down as an all-time great creator. Yeah. That's indubitably Stan Lee. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And also the person who was like, what if they are all inhabiting, I might be wrong about this, I'm pretty sure the idea that they're all inhabiting and having crossovers within this like expanded world, like the Justice League had its team-ups, right? And that was a thing which predated what Marvel was doing, but it was... It was like an it was like an individual thing, whereas like Marvel actually built it out as a broader universe, and that basically being a brilliant marketing way to get people to buy more comics. I feel like that's Stan, right? Not just that, but 
yes, it's a brilliant marketing move until it's not and people, you know, have a backlash to it. But it is just an unbelievably elegant creative move that changes the possibilities for storytelling that are in front of you so profoundly that it makes it seem obvious in retrospect. And the best creative ideas are like that, right? Like you can't imagine yourself having, you know, once experienced them, not having, not, pardon me, not having lived through it. And that's Stan Lee with, with, you know, at the minimum, writing creative herd over all of these books to ensure that there's a discernible, you know, look and feel to a Marvel comic that makes it unique and makes it special. And that resonates with, you know, however many millions of people, you know, around the world Mm -hmm. ever since. Secondly, Jack, I know, does to some degree at least give like rough dialogue notes on his on his penciled pages. But look, someone has to write these comics. And what everyone loves, in addition to the design of Marvel in the 60s, that's, you know, Jack, and that's Ditko, and that's Everett, and that's Gene Cohen, and that's Romita, and that's Buscema, and and on down the line. Um, it's, It's what these characters say. It's the way they say them. And it's the personality that comes across, you know, not just you know, through the expressions that that the artists draw, but the dialogue that has to match with it. Mm -hmm. And even if you want to say, you know, and I I don't think, even if I've heard people argue that really anyone could have dialogued Jack Kirby, and I I don't know how that's considered a serious idea. Yeah. Well, especially when, especially if you're looking at blogs like uh, Kirby Without Words, where you see, like, here's what here's what Jack drew, and they she removes Stan's words on from it, and then you can see like what changed when Stan put the words in it. Now, frequently, I prefer the story that Jack is telling quite mm-hmm. frequently, but granted, she's it's a self selected thing, right? She's choosing the pages for which this distinction would be most interesting and drawn. You know, frequently we have Jack t- creating visuals in which the female character is a total badass. And then Stanley comes in and writes around it. So it's actually Reed Richards was telling her what to do the whole time. Like right. that kind of thing happens regularly. But that also shows that Stan is changing what's happening in the story. So I might not always be happy with the end result, but it does it does shift things. And then there are lines of, specific, there's specific lines and sayings and phrases that are very much catchphrases that are very lasting, right? I mean, like you the said. The comic isn't just the plotting, it's the lines too. And like you said, you know, if all he ever wrote was with great power, must there also come great responsibility, die Anu. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's, it's, it's just an incredibly uh, powerful, resonant, and true thing to go in, into fiction that becomes immediately iconic and for all the right reasons. You know, you, mm-hmm. you empathize with that line you you try and emulate that line you try and live by it because you recognize its truth you judge the behavior of others by how well they they live up to that credo or they violate it or they're not sure which they're actually doing because they're not thoughtful enough to consider it right and that's the work of great art yeah yeah absolutely thank you i think that's a good that's a good place to place it. Um, but all, I, I mean, I just want to add one thing to that, mm-hmm. which is that like the way that comics work unique to them as a medium, the, the thing that's most director like of them is pacing, right? The, how you tell a story, how you change, expand, contract and shift the camera during periods of action, during periods of dialogue, of romance, or, you know, down, down the line of what you're doing, how you make the, the mm-hmm. form fit the function, how well you do that and how elegantly you do that, by necessity, marries the image to the text. 
And it's Stan's job, like it is Jack's job, to move this story along in the most enjoyable and story-suitable fashion. There's an apocryphal quote in which Stan once compares it to doing a crossword puzzle. And, like, typically that's used by Kirby people to kind of, you know, point at Jack and point, point at Stan and say, like, see, all he's doing is just, like, rote box filling um, after, you know, Jack has given him a finished text. And, no, it, like, it's, it's basically a way of expressing that he's writing under conditions you know, that are, that are strict in terms of what they'll allow, but he has to play around and that's the joy of it within these restrictions like a poet does. Mm -hmm. And until unleashing something that, you know, ideally marries what Jack has drawn with something, you know, as wild and as big ideaed as what Jack has done. If, and right. again, if he did nothing else but that, Dianu. But mm -hmm. you come to know who the thing is not just by, you know, Jack drawing him forever iconically in a raincoat feeling sorry for himself in the rain on the first page of This Man, This Monster. The best comic but ever. It truly is. And, you know, and Jack is right, you know, to say, like, the thing is Jack Kirby. Yes. Um, and you come to know the thing not just that way, but by the fact of what Stan, however much in this case, surely influenced by Jack uh, in the margin notes, is putting into these characters' mouths. And, you know, uh, that's a, probably a bad example um, from the perspective of the Stan stands. But, you know, all through, you know, the famous, um, you know, Spider-Man scene where, where Peter, you know, triumphs, you know, lift, literally lifting up his burdens in the name of shouldering his responsibility. In the most Steve Ditko thing that has ever happened. Uh, yes, truly. Um, but then on, you know, on and on down through the characters, you know, Stan was able to do that in such a way that gave the characters in, you know, in most cases, he's, he's, as you mentioned, pretty bad with women. Um, good God. Like there's this one. He, he was smart enough to know that it was good for them to be there. Right. Yeah. And like, you kind of wonder if that, you know, did did that count as woke at the for for the time, or yeah, or, I don't have a it, perspective on that. I mean, it's I, it's it, it truly is cringeworthy when you look at it. And, you know, it, right? Like, yeah, no, I, I yeah, I mean, I still can't get over like the really iconic ones again. If guys haven't checked out Kirby Without Words, go to her blog. But like to see like you know Sue Storm defeating her captor, like clearly that's what's happening in the image, and then Stan writes on top of it. Reed was directing her how to do it all along in a way that like doesn't even make sense narratively. But and you have to think in a certain point, like, is he thinking that that's what the audience needs to say? Because the audience can't conceive of things otherwise. Right. Yeah. Like, it's, it's sort of an interesting question. Like, is he underestimating the audience or is he just not able to conceive of the world in a different way? I'm not sure. I really don't know. Um, he was always someone who wanted to be seen as like pushing the pushing the world forward like he you know you can see like he wants to be seen as as someone who's socially aware and and supports equality like the, regardless of whether he's ever good at it like that's what he wants um so it's I, it's hard to know what's behind that piece but all of the brilliant work that stan did as someone who kind of was like i'm gonna go on college tour and talk to mm -hmm. university students about the importance of comics and like recognizing that like you know all the the, the, the stoners were like reading dr strange and being like ah oh, opening my third eye he's like yeah college tour like that kind of brilliant marketing and elevating comics in the public eye all of this sort of really brilliant marketing things he did he could have done all of those things and still given his the creators of the art equity there's no right like there's no everything wonderful he did could have been done even better had he treated the artists fairly and given them their fair share and ownership of the work that they created right and not just that um it's one of several elements that i think makes this story fundamentally tragic so first you know here is the greatest partnership you know, in the history of comics 
with the only arguable exception really being Siegel and Schuster, right? Mm-hmm. They make they make Marvel together. Mm-hmm. And then, like, one of them feels for the rest of his life that he's been done wrong. And has a lot of evidence behind him. That, you know, here are these two people who are so, you know, fantastic as, as artistic collaborators. Um, whose relationship is ruined uh, because of, you know, the subject that's at the heart of every single one of the stories they create. Justice. Mm-hmm. Stan Lee didn't create the comic book market. This is a a structural tragedy that goes beyond uh, any two people. But nevertheless, it played out in a very real way between these two people, which is that there is no collective bargaining in comics. This is a medium that's considered one step on the cultural rung above pornography. It's not respectable to read. It's not literature at all. Uh, And so the margins are never going to be very high. A whole lot of people in the early days of comics, uh, for reasons you will instantly understand, were organized crime figures because this was a great way to launder money. And... Mm -hmm. There just never was, oh, and and we can't forget, um, because of the social status that this industry, you know, this industry occupied, and this is a point excellently made by Michael Chabon in uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, this is basically open to, you know, like, basically ghettoized Jews and Italians. Yep. There are nearly no black people. Yeah. Yeah. There's basically no women. But and this is just that generation in that dynamic. They have no collective bargaining. They have no reason to expect that they'll ever be treated fairly. They're all freelancers. Individually, they don't command really any respect. It's not ironically until Stan Lee starts branding not just, you know, himself and not just Marvel, <clears throat> but the creators and then the creative process. With the his, Marvel method. You know, the Marvel method, the Marvel bullpen, you know, Smile and Stan, Jolly Jack. Jolly Jack Kirby. Can you Which imagine? is just how out of touch. Or, I'm or, they you, sh- or I, I prefer to view it as, as incredibly passive aggressive. I, God, that is brutal. I don't want to think that. Stan's maybe- not, Stan's <laughs> not stupid. That's fucked up. I mean, yeah. Allow totally. me to read to you. Allow me to read to everybody. Just because, like, This is brewing with such venom. This is the first thing you read when you open Mr. Miracle number six. For those of you who know, I'm sure most of you know, um, this is the issue where Jack, after having left Marvel and doing the New Gods for DC, introduces his Stan character, the disgusting swindler, funky Flashman. This is, it's, it's such an unbelievably vicious critique. Roy Thomas, his young assistant, like is just like a casualty of a drive-by and gets referred to as House Roy. Yeah. Like whatever it is that Stanley did to Jack Kirby, Roy Thomas doesn't deserve that. Jack is this pissed. He was basically like, your mans can get it too. And yeah. this is what, this is how this, this issue begins. In the shadow world between success and failure, there lives the driven little man who dreams of having it all. The opportunistic spoiler without character or values who preys on all things like a cannibal, including you. Like death and taxes, we all must deal with him sometime. That's why in this issue... We go where he lives, in the decaying antebellum grandeur of the Mockingbird Estates, and wait for Godot with Funky Flashman. And Jack Kirby does not put something in a southern plantation without making allusions to slavery. Like, that's very clear. It's in a southern plantation because this is a plantation runner. Like, that's what he is doing. People want to say Jack can't write. (laughs) 
Come on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who wants to say that. I will. I mean, I will fight them. I, I will. I will fight them so hard. Um, I mean, ugh, I, yeah, yeah. Like this is someone who's been traumatized by their work experience. And again, completely needlessly so. There's no reason that Marvel needed to be built on the backs of its workers that way. You know, I look at it as fucked up as the TV industry is. The narrative television had a career that people were getting health insurance for through the guild. Like there are other ways of managing workers in a creative industry. There are other, there's other ways for this to have been done. Can I add to that for a second? Mm -hmm. Something I didn't know until I started looking into the life and times of Jack Kirby is that in the 1960s, there are lots uh, of little like copyright law lawsuits that start popping up in the comic book industry. It isn't just, you know, the famous, you know, Superman case. There are like little ones that happen, particularly with like characters that kind of go in and out of copyright. Mm -hmm. And this is like one of the reasons there's this like arcane set of rules for which company can use Captain Marvel at which time. Yeah. And like the weird copyright reasons why like there is a Wonder Man at Marvel. Yeah. (laughs) Just to troll them, basically. But like... The point I'm making with this is that during the time when this is all happening, uh, around the mid-1960s, the comic book industry is seeing that there's a huge enough to be litigious problem between uh, labor and management over who owns what. And at that point, I don't think you can reasonably argue, even if you're being as, as, as generous to the comic book companies as, as possible, that after that moment, that shouldn't have sparked some kind of reckoning. And saying right. like, well, we should be at the very minimum paying licensing royalties or you know, incentivizing creators to create for us because you know, we understand that it's actually better for, you know, for our business to protect creator rights. You know, like how many uh, new characters have you seen in these universes really since image? Right. Mm-hmm. And they just never do that. And it takes comics close to another 10 years before like, uh, I think it's Jeanette Kahn and Paul Levitz start introducing a royalty system uh, on yes. top of, on top of page rates. And the point Can't is, is now. that like, this is all a tragic story made all the more tragic by a structural injustice one that Mm -hmm. doesn't really seem you know for all of the you know subsequent creation of the royalty system to have been addressed you know you hear all these stories about you know how hand-to-mouth it is being a freelancer in a small margin business like comics and you know that fear you know by someone like jack kirby who grew up in really very serious poverty, uh, then experienced the depression after that, uh, that explains everything for why it was that, you know, Jack, you know, did all of this work for hire. Like this was what was available to him that, you know, and not just that, like it, it, it was also what he loved and what he was passionate about. He was, he was addicted to, to being Jack Kirby and not, you know, going back to being Jacob Kurtzman. <laughs> Kurtzberg. Um, Kurtzberg, yeah. Pardon me. Oof. Um, and, you know, when Stan died, you know, it really did kind of feel, you know, like, you know, new godsy. There came the day when the old gods died, right? Like this, mm. this, this era. Yeah, yeah. So know, soon after Ditko too, right? Like. Oh, totally. And, you know, you know, it's interesting. I think Ditko hated Stan worse than Jack did, but less than Ross yes. Kirby did. Yes, that sounds right. It's Ross Kirby who, like, by Stan's telling, calls Stan up after the infamous New York Herald Tribune piece in January of 1966 that, like, centers entirely around Stan Lee 
and like the genius of Stanley, who like Fellini comes to New York to visit and describes Jack instantly, uh, in, infamously rather, as uh, resembling an assistant foreman in a girdle factory. Which is like the most fucked up classist and exactly the way that that takes place, like way to describe Jack Kirby. It's like, yes, Jack Kirby's family, like, yeah, of equivalents are working at a girdle factory because we're Jews from New York City, asshole. Like, and guess what? You can be straight out of making a girl working at a girdle factory in New York City and also be the finest artist of like the generation like you can do that that's not at no, odds with themselves you fucking classist shithead it's it's yeah. despicable and it's Roz Kirby who calls up Stan and just chews the fuck out of him and is like screaming in Stan's ear how could you let this happen to Jack oh yeah well she's also Bobby. the one who sees how hard he works like yes. Jack is, see, you know, like she's the one who's seeing what he's going through. She's the one who's like, you haven't eaten. Like she has a particular view of what he's gone through and sacrificed for his art to support the family. So, yeah. Yeah. You're the wife, definitely the angriest person in, in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And and then Ditko, you know, is not as well compensated as Jack's and also is Steve Ditko and therefore is the second most upset. That, and that also, right. you know, it it's. It gets, you know, talked about a whole lot less, but, like, Jack makes a pretty dubious claim to have created Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, no, that's weird as hell. And, like, But that's, like, getting back at people who have already, you feel like you've already been warned. Well, I'll show them. I can be specious, too, you know? um, you, You don't often hear it put in these terms, but, like, that's a pretty unfair thing to do to Steve Ditko, is basically... In, in what looks like a way of, of getting back at Stan, kind of treating Dicko creatively as, as collateral damage, which is, mm-hmm. you know, a great deal of the substance of his, you know, reason to feel wronged by Stan Lee. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, these are complicated figures. And, you know, as, you know, as much as we're talking about people who create superhero universes... Um, you know, these, these guys, you know, I'm not trying to suggest that there's an equivalence between Stan and Jack. There isn't, um, just that, you know, don't, don't make people into, into heroes or icons or gods. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't actually know much about this, but one of my friends was telling me that at one point when, um, when Jack and uh, I don't recall someone else were trying to start their own comic company. Like they were, they had labor management, you know, and unfairness on their end too, right? Yeah. Instead huh. of looking at a model that's like damaged and is not looking, is doesn't doesn't know how to support people. Well, but. one thing we also probably should have gotten into a bit um, is, you know, you you had mentioned this is my fault for for not cycling back. Um, you had mentioned that um, you know Stan has a civil rights legacy. Mm-hmm. And and Marvel does. Um, but, you know, you, you would also see in those soapbox columns um, a, re- a real reluctance, you know, to, to engage beyond putting his finger in the wind. Yeah. On, yeah. on Stan's part. And that's the last thing you can say about Jack Kirby. So, like, there's this one soap, there's this one, like, letter column or soapbox from, like, 1967. You know, so like pretty into the Vietnam War in which like people are writing in and saying, you know, what, do, what, what, what does Marvel, you know, think about Vietnam? And like Stan deflects the hell out of it and, you know, writes something about like, I'm not sure if, you know, you put us in, uh, you know, in the Marvel bullpen together, if we'd agree on anything besides like mom and apple pie. And you know, readers keep writing in and just, you know, saying, like, I, I don't find that really to be a satisfactory answer, considering <laughs> the gravity of what we're talking about. Um, and, you know, the audience, you know, who you cater to, who are expected to, you know, fight and die in this war. And it's, yes. it's then, you know, a couple months later, when, like, Stan jumps down, you know, from, from his numerous fences and writes that, you know, justly celebrated, you know, civil rights soapbox. Mm 
that he's he's justly uh, acclaimed for. Um, Jack Kirby was not like that. Jack would you know say in interviews, um, admittedly after the fact. So you know it it is hard to say you know how how he was contemporaneously, but all of the evidence uh, points to him being you know a really aggressive and you know consistent anti-fascist turned like you know cold war era liberal but yeah. like not with a lot of the hang-ups that often went along with that like he he you know in interviews talks about how stupid and futile he thought the vietnam war was uh how when he ever talks about his war comics he talks about you know the whole thing being a con you see those ideas a whole lot in new gods um mm-hmm. you know the the way in which sta- the way in which jack kirby understands fascism in new gods is is nearly unparalleled in contemporary fiction like the the fact that you know the the shock troops on earth are the justifiers right like how much does that say how much how much do we see that in modern society yeah right and i definitely point folks to the piece that i wrote for your Indeed. outlet daily beast about uh, about trump and um jack kirby's fourth world but you know but yeah also just like like kirby was literally writing like anti-vietnam comics on the stands like that were very explicitly clearly that right um and and so it's i think to put you know stan and jack in perspective like you know stan you know writes literally the history of marvel comics himself and its civil rights legacy is an important element of that history it you know again even if he's just an editor-in-chief who's going around figuring out how to get the best out of kirby how to get the best out of ramita how to get the best out of Ditko, how to get the best out of Gene Cullen out of Herb Trimpey, uh, you know, Herb Trimpey, you know, and, 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 and John Buscema and, and all the way down the line. Creatively, that's enough, right? Like you, as you know, I'm a journalist, I have editors, I've worked for, you know, amazing editors, and I've worked for absolute pieces of shit. And the great editors are the ones who build teams that they trust, and like unleash them and support them. Um, and even if, you know, Stan, who, you know, pretty clearly in, in the artist's estimation, you know, did not always support them. Um, even if Stan is just creatively wise enough to step back and let that happen, and yeah. that's the result, Marvel Comics, like, that's pretty creatively incredible. And the same thing for his civil rights legacy. If all he does mm-hmm. is allow these amazing artists to tell their civil rights and anti-fascism and, you know, you may be called or considered outcasts and freaks, but you're not. Even if that's all Stan does is just like green light those ideas, then he's the greatest editor in chief in the history of comics. And he's yeah, by I default, mean, he, one yep. of the greatest, sorry. Yes. And I was, when I, in an earlier conversation, when I was saying like, wait, so what did Stan Lee come up with after Jack left? in terms of new characters and I was just completely drawing a blank one of my friends pointed out uh, Eric Cleveland pointed out Falcon oh okay right yeah so like that is actually a great thing yeah um creating the I Falcon didn't, was the I first didn't know African that American super- yes the Falcon was created by Stanley and Gene Colan great artist in 1969 Falcon's um, like a community organizer in those he's early a, he's issues a social, right? he's a social worker he's a social worker social yeah worker. and then they and then they retconned which is like something that stan lee did he like came up with a he, he co-created a african-american superhero when there hadn't been one when when black jack panther talks about black panther he talks about it from the perspective of shane like he his line about this in in an interview it i i put this in a a piece for for Kirby's hundredth birthday that I wrote for for the Daily Beast is basically like I fought and you know I I like I fought and bled with black people, which is probably not true because you fought in a segregated army. Um, yeah. I, you know, these are my friends. These are you know the kids that I grew up with. You know, in the Lower East Side, probably proximate. Um, 
and I felt embarrassed and ashamed that I hadn't drawn a black character. And that in in Jack's version is is the genesis of the black, of the Black Panther. I don't know if I've heard Stan give a version of the creation of, of Black Panther, but that was the one that Jack gave. Yeah. That's incredibly powerful. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but that was an interesting thing, the other, to, to think about in terms of Stan. And the other thing that somebody also, um, Matt Olivieri called to attention that was a recent interview with Stan where somebody, an interviewer asked Stanley, like, well, what do you think of the fact that Iceman is gay now? And Stan Lee said, I didn't know that about him. I think that's really exciting. And like, Mm -hmm. if you would hope that all creators had the understanding that that is the right answer, right? To like embrace that and view it as an opportunity. And like that the enthusiasm that he had in response to that seemed like real, right? And we can also- it's also like the smart, yeah. No, I'm sorry, I interrupted. It's, it's also the smart thing financially, but it also seems genuine. And, you know, you know, when we had a far younger person like Rob, you know, Rob Liefeld, far younger person, generationally someone who must have had a different oh, you know, contact right. with, with LGBTQ people. Rob, you know, people were like, hey, Rob Liefeld, these various characters that you've created are gay. Rob Liefeld was like, no, they're not. Now, Rob is since lends for his ways but nevertheless he's someone who is just a bajillion years younger than stan and did not get that right away this is a total tangent but i can't help myself a couple a couple years ago because i had like stopped reading comics around like the time maybe like a year or two after um liefeld and them leave to form image um i recently just like picked up a ton of like you know, 20 issue, like 20 to issue, like 45 of X-Force from like dollar bins before they were put on, on Marvel Unlimited. And those are ones that, that Fabian Nicieza writes. They're excellent. Uh, the Jay and Miles yeah. explain the X-Men podcast uh, is recently, you know, into these issues. And I'm, 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 I feel very validated to say that they agree. Um, and one of the things that Nicieza very clearly introduces is the romance between Richter and Shatterstar that Rob initially objected to. Yep. That is yep. on yep. panel. Like, it is not... It's it's not, like, explicitly romantic. They could have been braver in, like, showing them embrace. But they are clearly together. And that's one of the reasons why I was so happy that they were characters who, like... Peter David, someone who else, there's lots of complicated things to be said of, uh, was like, they're a couple, they're they're queer, they're together. Like, rather than just pulling out some character out of thin air to assign it to, like, he actually listened to what fans, especially queer fans, had been saying mm-hmm. for years. And was like, I hear you, what you say makes sense, and I will make that subtext even more explicitly text. Um, and I know that there are people who felt that that there was reason, that, that there are things in that I know that there are people who saw things in, in Iceman's history that were like okay no I, I feel like I recognize him as queer but like but he wasn't the top of the list of characters that we all were like for fuck's sake we know these people are queer mm-hmm. um, and uh, Peter David went right to the top of the list right of in terms of like yes these two guys are out and he did that in, because people had read the, the Chesa uh, like work and like understood it properly but but your point um, is 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 anyway, really sorry. correct that you know it means a lot that Stan would have had that reaction. It's, you know, it's not just like, you know, accepting or knowing and being media savvy enough, you know, in a cynical way to be like, yes, Iceman's gay, but being enthusiastic about it. You know, that's, that's, um, Evan Narciss put this, I think this way on, um, on, on Kotaku's podcast, you know, he's enthusiastic and wants you to be enthusiastic. Right. Um, and he does that, you know, for something that's such a, an, an important show of visibility for so many people who love comics and love these characters. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I don't, I, I was thinking about like, what was the first instance of an interracial couple in Marvel comics? Um, yeah. And I was not exactly sure on that, but what I do know is that Wolfman and Perez were not allowed to have Cyborg be clearly in a relationship with Sarah Sims in the year of our Lord, like 1980. 1980 right. 
like something 1980 and change and it's like good god um you know i know for a fact that scott was in relationship with cindy moon in the 70s right well you you um, also know my and, thing about cyborg and beast boy there are a couple. yes i am aware as well cyber and Bigor, yes they are a couple I, that I, I, am, I am completely recognizing of that. Like you, you, you put that together very effectively in an, uh, something that I, folks could read on graphic policy website <laughs> that I wrote earlier. But, um, but yeah, the fact that like as, as late as the 1980s, DC wasn't letting Wolf Ben and Perez yeah. like have a black man and white woman be a couple. First interracial kiss in a superhero comic was Misty Knight and Iron Fist in a 1977 Iron story by Chris Claremont and John Byrne. In X Factor, so. Angel had a black girlfriend. She was a police officer. I'm drawing a blank on oh, her name, and I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting, and I'm and I apologize for that. Um, but that was probably around the same time as that was like mid '80s, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is something that we could find out, though. But um, but yeah, like yeah. I think it, it. I do feel like it generally looks like Marvel was more comfortable with doing these things before DC was. Yeah. It generally, looks to be that way. Um, so there's that. Uh. So yeah, I you know I knew that you were looking and doing some additional reported work about Stan and Lee that you know I, some obviously like now that he's died there's a parts of this that can never be reported but like what are the things that you would have loved to have been able to interview him about if you'd had the ability to do so? Well, I did interview Stan once. Um, it was around the time that um, do you remember he did a documentary uh, show called like With Great Power. Or maybe it was like a, um, a a show about him. I think that's I think that's what it was. Um, I was working for Wired at the time. I, I to this day do not know if this piece ever appeared. I can never find it. If it did, um, I assume it was for Wired because that's where I was working. And I interviewed Stan for like fifteen minutes about his life. I tried to get him to like. Basically, I was hubristic enough to think that I would be the interviewer that would get Stan Lee to admit that he stole all of these great ideas and vast amounts of wealth from Kirby and Ditko and the rest of them. Ah, uh, yes. And listener, that was not what happened in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So, like, Stan did his, his like, perfect, you know, tried and true, you know, deflection that, you know, I always credited them. Uh, you know, I always wanted everyone to know that Jack Kirby was the king of comics and so on and so forth. Um, that are, that are all of these, you know, really masterful evasions. Um, but you know, also like, I, you know, you get a lot from, from creators that, you know, in a medium like this, it is genuinely hard to tell, you know, ultimately whose idea came from where. And I hear that from just too many people and you've read that you know, in too many interviews, um, I think to not take seriously or to, you know, even if you think it is something of a diplomatic cliche, um, it's, it's so often repeated, uh, by the practitioners and, you know, the most significant practitioners of this art form that there just simply must be truth to it. And, um, Mark Evanier, uh, who is one of Kirby's biographers and one of his assistants, in the 1970s, uh, would say about the Fantastic Four, the creation that's probably the most uncontroversially jacks at Marvel, right? He, Evanier says of the Fantastic Four, Stan and Jack created it together. And that was always the sense, that this was Stan and Jack together. And at the end of the day, that seems to be just true, that this, you know, isn't, in, in this kind of insane dialectic that we've been caught up in for decades, um, a zero sum story. The, the trouble is, is that Stan, you know, consistently and frequently enough to, you know, make it inconceivable that it was not deliberate, always put himself in the creative driver's seat and everyone else uh, in a subordinate position. And that's the yeah. that's both the injustice and the tragedy of it. When there was enough creative credit for a thousand lifetimes to justly accrue to Stanley, he had to, you know, subtly and um, 
insidiously, especially given, you know, what an expert orator and, you know, salesman he was, deliberately treat himself as, as the sole author of, of, of these works that he was not the sole author of. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like a compulsion at a certain point. Like, the lie has to keep going. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I don't think he's Bob Kane. No, no. Right? No. Like, I don't mean, yeah, I don't mean, like, a literal lie. Like, I mean, like, the, the mythology. Like, once you have put out there that this is what the story is, you can't just change that because that's yeah. the legend that you've put out. And for those and, who and don't again, know, you, you do you want to explain the Bob I, Kane why, thing? Why don't you do that? I don't know if I can <laughs> adequately. I haven't looked okay. at it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not exactly. I'm not an expert at that either. But like but Bob Kane tried to take credit for Batman and did not actually create Batman. That like Bill Finger, there's a there's a Hulu documentary about this I watched uh, called Batman and Bill. Um, that the writer Bill Finger was the mostly uncredited, you know, uh, creator of like Robin and the Joker and and, you know, aspects of batman's mythology that are central and not peripheral um mm-hmm. and bob kane uh explicitly lies about this for decades and says that he does everything or at least is the best of my understanding i apologize yeah. i haven't researched this um that's 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 how i understand it I'm, I'm not totally sure if uh if that's true i apologize i'm not trying to vouch for that story no problem. Yeah, but basically, it's not like that kind of a story. It's not that level of of, of extremity. But yeah, like it's he's going to keep the party line because that's what he's been saying, and he's really a myth maker and a storyteller, yeah. and he believes in the stories he tells. So that's the other piece of it, right? Like if you tell yourself the same thing for long enough, and you live long enough to repeat it enough, then that is your reality. Yes, I don't know that it's possible to get a different answer. You could have hooked up Stan to. Uh, molten morrison's truth lie detector machine (laughs) and would have gotten the same answer absolutely i you know yeah yeah at that point and in the telling of the story that's that's what the story is to you so well thank you for joining us i i really feel like oh my gosh did i even get to talk about being i talked about him about jews being excluded from we talked about how social status meant that comic books were a place that you know jews and, and italians from from lower class backgrounds could work the fact that people need to acknowledge that the reason why stanley was in the comics industry and not writing the great american novel which had always been his life's dream was because he was jewish yes like that, that. okay so we'll wrap this then um so spencer let, let our listeners know where can they find your works and thinkings well, I want to thank you so much for having me on. Um, I love talking about this stuff. Um, you can find me at thedailybeast.com uh, most days a week um, doing uh, reported pieces on national security. Um, and you can also find me uh, wasting time on Twitter at Attackerman. Attackerman, yes. And uh, thank you for listening, guys. We're going to be back with Spencer with an episode about Daredevil Season 3. Can't wait to do it very shortly. And um, as always, you can find Graphic Policy at graphicpolicy.com. I am on Twitter too much at Elana underscore Brooklyn, E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. Um, Come and talk about Jack Kirby, Stanley, comics history, and being a Jew this time of year. And uh, looking forward to having those conversations with you all. As we like to say in graphic policy, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.